Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Hero Hero Go Show. Um, a couple of days late, I know we've been trying to get these out every two weeks, uh, hopefully on a Saturday or a Sunday, but uh, it's spilled over into Monday this time. Um, I, and I think you'll understand why. This is a slightly different show from the one that we've been doing on the iSeries. Um, this time around, we are going to be doing... Um, a show all about, uh, uh, actually a recommendation that I caught on Facebook somewhere and I apologize for not recalling who, uh, directly mentioned it, but, uh, someone said, Hey, what about that movie tag that Sion Sono did a, a while back? And I said, you know what? It is time. It is time to do a patented hero, hero, go show deep dive on a movie. And, uh, rather than have, uh, another host here with me. Um, it's just going to be you and I, uh, what I call, uh, this time around the solo Sono show, uh, because I like alliteration and homophones. So, uh, I wanted to, to dig into this movie, um, in a, in a pretty substantial way. And so I'm going to tell you right now, there are going to be spoilers. If you have never seen the movie tag, I cannot recommend enough that you do so before you listen to this show. Um, I'll spoilers tag is really good and you ought to see it. Uh, but to get into the, the what's and wherefores of the movie tag, we have to talk fairly extensively about the plot. And, and also I'm going to talk thematically, uh, about the movie. And there is no way to talk about the theme of the movie without talking about the ending of the movie. So, all that being said, you ought to see Tag. Um, if you are still here, then, hey, fair warning. You have been told, hey, we are going to spoil the shit out of the movie Tag. Uh, and here we go. This is not, <laughs> in fact, the comedy Tag, uh, but instead uh, the uh, the film by Sion Sono. And Sion Sono um, is someone we have talked about before, uh, for sure, and, and his level of artistry. Uh, in particular, his background in the visual arts as well as poetry. And he's a little bit of a mad genius, but um, when when we do these solo Sono shows, we're going to try to put uh, Sono's work in, in a larger context of, of his filmography. And so Tag was released in 2015, and Sono has always been a prolific director, no no doubt about that. But 2015 is a particularly productive year for Sion Sono. He releases five movies in 2015, one of them, of course, being uh, Tag, the subject of uh, our show tonight. Now, just before this rush of movies, he'd done a pair of movies portraying the Fukushima reactor disaster and then the Tohoku earthquake, and then backed those movies up with a movie called Why Don't You Play in Hell?, which was highly acclaimed and is definitely a movie that we are going to cover here. Now, after Why Don't You Play in Hell, Sono then directed a hip-hop musical called Tokyo Tribe, which was based on a manga of the same name, and then launches into his five-picture run in 2015. Now, over the course of the preceding films, Sono had pivoted from, you know, really stark dramas about national disasters to, well, you know, uh, hip hop musicals. So Sono was continuing to indulge himself creatively. Um, his career has a bit of David Lynch to it, who, uh, who proved that he could do these big crowd pleasing dramas like the elephant man and the straight story while still celebrating his own unique artistic vision. And then throw in some Takashi Miike with Sono uh, because Miike's body of work has the same kind of anarchic thematic consistency as a Sono, although he somehow manages to trump Sono on output. So, in, in terms of prolific directors, Japan is not hurting for them. Uh, and also, they tend to be very good, which is uh, the, the thing we don't get right. We got plenty of directors in the U.S. making lots of movies all the time, but they're all garbage. Uh, there's not, we, we, we don't have the kind of like prolific auteur the way that Japan does with, uh, Sono Miike. Um, so tag is a relatively short movie 
in Sono's body of work at a breezy 85 minutes. And it, it's also going to present an interesting challenge for us here on Hero Year Go Show. Um, so let's let's start. Spoilers ahead as we lay down the plot here. And then we try to figure out what the hell all of this was about. The movie tag is based on a novel called Real Onigoku from 2001. The plot of the novel involves everyone with the name Sato being hunted by the government. And uh, you can see a more direct adaptation of that story in the movie The Chasing World. But in typical Sono fashion, this is a very loose adaptation of this novel. And to get to the thematic meat, we're going to need to talk plot. So if you haven't seen Tag, this is your final warning. I encourage you to watch the movie before listening any further. But you are human with free will and can make your own decisions here. So without further ado, Tag boasts one of the best opening sequences in movie history. Full stop. Our first of three protagonists, Mitsuko, is on her way to a summer camp. And she is played by the really impressive Reina Trindle. Uh, she's sensitive, she's a poet, and she bends down to grab a lost pen when this mysterious force comes out of nowhere, cleaving through the bus, decapitating or dismembering everybody on the bus but Mitsuko. It is astounding. And it's worth noting right here that the special effects are provided by Gosho Hero, Yoshihiro Nishimura, a Facebook friend and director of Tokyo Core Police. So the effects are kind of bonkers. But it turns out that Nishimura has done a lot of effects work for Sion Sono, which is a thing that makes me very, very happy. So on the run from this invisible force, Mitsuko is chased into a high school while people are just bisected behind her. And I can't overstate how fucking insane the opening of tag is so please even if you haven't watched any other part of the movie watch the first 10 minutes of tag and if you don't watch the rest of the movie from there i don't know what's wrong with you once mitsuko is chased into this high school they, then things get weird right so weirder inside it's a regular day of high school and everyone seems to know who mitsuko is but the only person she recognizes is her best friend, Aki. So there's a great reading of this movie as a sort of like queer manifesto, though I wonder if that's what Sono really intended. Still, in this reading, the relationship between Aki and Mitsuko is a romantic one, and we have certainly seen plenty of movies out of Eastern cultures where girls' schools provide a backdrop for implied lesbian romance. See the Wishing Stairs movies if you have any doubts of that. So when Aki and Mitsuko escape class for a little bit with their friends Teiko and Sir, which is short for Surreal, by the way, not a lot of subtext with that one, they head to this local forest where Sir, short for Surreal, tells Mitsuko, Life is surreal. Don't let it get to you. Don't let it consume you. And so then there's a weird vision with a creature eating Taiko, and then they go back to school and the kids are immediately attacked by all the teachers uh, with, uh, like, machine guns. And they, the teachers just massacre students. Mitsuko goes on the run again, flees out of this school. And she finds a policewoman who she reports this massacre to, as you do when you have just borne witness to a bunch of teachers killing all of your classmates. But the policewoman is like, hey, Keiko... Where have you been? It's your wedding day. And she's like, the fuck? And then looks in a, in a mirror and sees uh, in the reflection that she is a completely different person uh, who apparently is named Keiko. And it's a different actor and everything. And along with it, of course, a, a different name. And with that, a different threat. Because she isn't being chased by evil winds or gun-toting teachers. She is late for her own wedding. So she gets hurried to this chapel where inside these women are kind of jostling her and pushing her towards the inevitable married fate until Aki reappears and tells all these other ladies to fuck off. And so Keiko, a.k.a. Mitsuko, is thrilled to see her friend Aki reappear 
And Aki tells her, look, all those other ladies, totally evil. So <laughs> what you've got to do is we've got to get you out of here and you're going to need this. And then hands uh, Keiko a broken, the like a broken bottleneck, like a liquor bottle. And um, she also tells Keiko, Aki does, that they're in a totally different world. And so when these women come back, Aki just goes fucking bananas on them and just murders them all. And then <laughs> hands, uh, this is where she hands Keiko the, the broken bottle and she's like, hey, you're going to need this. Now get out there into that, that wedding chamber. And so Keiko goes out into the wedding area where there are more women waiting for her. And they start pushing her to the front of the room where, again, not a whole lot of subtext here. There is a coffin waiting for her uh, in place of a groom. And so Keiko slash Mitsuko is being shoved forward and, and sort of the merriment of these women morphs into this really uh, like aggressive shoving where they're angry and then they start taking off their clothes uh, which I know sounds like a weird thing to happen, but they they strip down to their underwear and they keep shoving Keiko forward, you know, and, uh, towards this coffin. And once she gets to the front of the room, the coffin opens up and inside we see the first male figure we have seen in the entire movie. It's been completely women, including the teacher so far. And so the first man we see literally has the head of a pig. Uh, it's a literal drooling, slobbering pig head on a human body. And uh, she, Keiko is struggling against this as the women are, you know, pushing her at this pig guy. And then Aki shows up again and, and starts, you know, beating the shit out of all these women and gives Keiko, now Keiko, an opportunity to run, which she does. And as she's running, um, we, we see her uh, like hauling ass right into another character completely. And now she is uh, Izumi. And she is a marathon runner who is running alongside seemingly familiar women. She seems to know who they are. And they're, you know, kind of chit-chatting. And she looks into the, the sidelines of this marathon and women are cheering her on and they want her to win. Everybody's chanting and, and, uh, and, and cheering for Izumi. And, um, then she looks behind her to see that she's now being chased by some of the women from the wedding, as well as this pig headed gentleman, uh, that, that presented a little bit of a problem in the last scene. And Aki of course shows up again. Uh, because she is forever showing up to to save the ass of Keiko slash Azumi slash Mitsuko. And <laughs> I get very Lynchian that there are, you know, three characters that are all kind of one person. Um, and Aki tells her, like, you gotta, you, you can't stay on the marathon path. You gotta get off the path. You gotta forge your own way, uh, one might say, uh, and, and get out of this world and into another one which she does. She makes her way all the, all the way to this cave where a bunch of schoolgirls are hanging out telling her that all of their deaths are her fault. And once more, Aki shows up and she's like, get, get out of here, ghosts. Get the hell on out of here. And, and so they do. And then she kind of gives Mitsuko some more exposition and, and hints as to sort of what the true nature of this existence is. And, uh, she, she says that, um, you know, all this bouncing through different people in different worlds, um, that this is, uh, like her, her fate to some extent. And, and that she has to repeat to herself that her name is Mitsuko and, uh, or Mits, Mitsuko. And, and she has to do that until it's true. And sure enough, uh, Azumi does that until she's the original Mitsuko again from the, from the film's beginning, from the crazy ass, you know, bus scene. And now that she's been restored to her former self, Mitsuko finds that Aki now has wires coming out of her 
and it's not too dissimilar from like the veins in Nightmare on Elm Street 3 um, except that there are lots of them and in one of certainly the gorier scenes in this movie Mitsuko starts trying to pull all the wires out of Aki but ultimately Aki tells Mitsuko you've got to destroy me you have to you have to completely destroy me to continue and so Mitsuko keeps yanking at the wires and Aki literally comes apart and when she does it provides this opening door for Mitsuko who spills into a new world which is literally called the man's world and it's this gross alley where guys are shirtless and sweaty and the whole place is lit like a shitty Saw movie and it's just disgusting. And Mitsuko is like dodging all these like leering oafs and then she sees an ad for a video game, one that features her and Keiko and Izumi on the cover. And before she can kind of wrap her head around what she's seen, this well-dressed man in a suit sort of interrupts her and he says, I'm surprised that you've made it this far. You're in the future now. And then he just kind of hurls her into this other world where we're in this sort of blown out building where she finds, you know, sort of living statues of herself and Keiko and Izumi and, you know, uh, all, all these figures that she's met on her travels and there in the room with her is this super old guy playing a video game and on the screen of the game uh, or the game he's playing it's just scenes from the movie that we've seen and he sees Mitsuko and he says oh you died a long time ago and here is the crazy ass sci-fi explanation for what's going on in this movie as best as I can give it to you which is that all three of these girls were are, are dead have been long dead but before they were you know interred or uh, uh, burned or whatever or cremated they uh, he took some of their blood which had their DNA and he used their DNA to create these characters in this game which kind of gives them this immortality but it also means that they are just puppets they are like you know Aki in the cave uh, or even running the marathon on its path like they are uh, they are performing a task and and no more and, and no less and so Mitsuko uh sees a young man appear who may or may not be to video on your interpretation a younger version of the old dude that we're seeing uh but i'll leave that to you but that's kind of what i think is happening here but anyway he goes to a bed sits down kind of pats it and is like hey baby how about you sit down and so mitsuko does she goes to him she lays down on the bed and he gets on top of her as if he's going to be, uh, you know, for, not forcing himself, but she's going to be this docile lover. She's going to accept her role of just being this kind of, you know, fuck doll for this dude. And then she has a, a flashback of the beginning of the movie where Surreal, Sir, says, hey, life is surreal. Don't get too hung up on this shit. Um, and at that point... She rips apart one of the pillows on the bed, smothers the young dude, and then goes about grabbing the cane uh, that this old man has. And instead of murdering him, what she does is uh, she kills herself. She stabs herself with this cane. Um, as she does that, we also see uh, Keiko um, kill herself with the, the broken bottle that Aki gave her. Uh, Azumi commits suicide and and in a final scene after all this violence um, we see Mitsuko running through this snow pure snow covered hill and so uh, the, all of that begs the question uh, what in the hell and here is my response um, 
there's no question that Sion Sono is dealing with feminist themes in this movie, but I want to start with that queer interpretation that, that I read that I really liked, which I don't think is entirely what Sono was getting at, but I think it, it speaks to the point that Sono is an artist and his movies can be interpreted a number of ways, and we're going to talk about a couple of them. This is one of my favorites because it also felt very personal to the reviewer where uh, she was talking about uh, Mitsuko representing, you know, your typical um, Japanese schoolgirl, both being sexualized, objectified, but she has this, you know, kind of burgeoning romance with, with Aki. And that, you know, the, you see institutional uh, discrimination in the form of the teachers mowing down the kids more symbolic than literal, but, but still it's, it's uh, a, f a foundation, an institutional foundation, um, or I'm sorry, foundational institution, um, going after a student that dares, like all of that happens after her little sojourn into the woods with Aki. Um, the marriage of course is a very direct, I mean, whether or not this is about her being gay, uh, clearly the idea of being thrust towards a man to fulfill the role of doting wife is something that Mitsuko slash Keiko slash Azumi, uh, that they, they, they don't want to be trapped in that role. And, and then, I mean, we see representatives of that pursuing her, uh, throughout the film. We, we go to the man's world where we see everybody, you know, all these dudes, the one time in the movie where we see a bunch of men gathered together um, and they're all just gross and staring at her and, you know, everybody looks like they smell like cigars and, and stale beer. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I think there is a great read of that to say that this is the experience of uh, sort of burgeoning, you know, be becoming lesbian as a, a young girl when all of society is telling you that this this is wrong and you have a character in the form of surreal saying like no 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 don't get hung up on all the social stuff you gotta you gotta be yourself you gotta you gotta cut the strings you you know uh you you've you've got to become uh a woman who determines her own fate and which is what the characters do at the end of the film by killing themselves they are you know, it's it's sort of the ultimate fuck you to their creators, which is to destroy themselves to uh, to find a measure of happiness outside this world where they're nothing but puppets. And um, there's also in that read the the idea that the women, as they strip themselves in the church, that that is sort of taunting. Keiko with this idea of like here are these beautiful young women's bodies that you can never possess this is you got to marry this big guy uh, because that's how it's done um, and and uh, you know we talked about the thing with with Aki and and Aki telling her like no you've got to step outside the norms of society and and even if that was never the intent right like this is undeniably about the pressure of women to conform to to social structures and and social uh, traditional social roles and whether that's gay or not like i i think that's a great read and i think there's plenty of meat there like if you turn that essay into me i could i if you cited your work i would give you an a um but i don't know that that's what sono is getting at in particular it's certainly as i said feminist and and, and very uh very boldly feminist and once we get to this Matrix-esque conclusion where we realize that an even greater control has been asserted here, that a man literally controls these women with a joystick, the only possible response by our heroines is to act of their own accord for the first time, free themselves of these strings uh, like the wires we saw in Aki, and then uh, you know, perform this act of, of independence and rebellion with their suicides. And it's interesting to see Sono kind of plan his flag uh, as far as, you know, making this sort of feminist manifesto and to do it in such a typically like Sono way of making it really audacious and crazy and surreal and gory. 
but before we we get too uh, enthusiastic, it's worth weighing a couple of things here. So there are some uncomfortable elements of this movie, namely it's sort of the leering of the camera. Sono celebrated upskirt photography more than any filmmaker that I know of with his movie Love Exposure, which is probably his magnum opus. And it's not not really a horror movie by any any stretch, um, but it's probably something we'll talk about because it is like one of Sono's early films, but it's also a movie that that definitely put him on the world stage. And, and it's crazy. I mean, it's a four-hour movie about an, a, a heroic upskirt photographer. And I can't recommend it enough. It's a great movie. Uh, did I mention it's four hours? But it, it's terrific. Um, anyway, we'll talk about it at some point. But that, like, that movie is very, uh, obviously very sexual. Although it, you know, again, we'll talk about love exposure another time. But even that, the heroic character even though he's an upskirt photographer, it's more about the art of it than it is about the sexuality of it in a weird way. Um, and so there, it, it's hard to say that Sono doesn't have like a fondness for panty shots. And this movie is filled with young women in their underwear, especially shots of their panties. And the big question is, is Sono portraying the male gaze here or is he both indulging in and critiquing the male view of women. And and this reminds me of another review I read that kind of invoked the name of Dave Chappelle. And if you don't recall, Dave Chappelle was at the height of his success when he quit The Chappelle Show and then fucked off to Africa for a while to, to kind of get his arms around the, the rapid success he had experienced. And he said that he was starting to get the feeling that some of the folks that were watching his show weren't laughing at the irony of it they were laughing with no appreciation for the fact that Dave Chappelle was doing very clever things with these stereotypes and, and sort of challenging them. They just wanted to see the stereotypes at all. Didn't matter if you were making fun of it. it you know, if it, like uh, some of the, the racially tinged stuff is, you know, it's from a very particular perspective. And if you're not watching it from that perspective, then you're you're enjoying it on a more like simpler and puerile level and maybe getting the wrong message and so that being said there is an idea that sono might be Chappelle here maybe or he's a hypocrite so i like to think that it's the former which feels very sono to me or or is it Sion Sono criticizing the audience itself, us, for wanting to see the panty shots and then putting us as the audience on trial in the last moments as, you know, this old man video game player and then the young guy that just wants to fuck, you know, is Sono sort of saying like, this is kind of who men are. You know, we have the, all the, the, the pig guy, We've got all the, the sleaze balls in the man's world. And now we have, um, you know, these characters in the, in this final scene, all representing sort of, you know, various, uh, types of men, you know, kind of r different reflections of men through that prism. And I, I wonder if that's not Sono saying, you know, you're, you're like this sort of behavior is ultimately destroying the thing that you kind of say you love and, uh, that these girls, you know, killing themselves, um, is destroying like men are pushing these, these women to kill themselves by their behavior. So anyway, I, I don't have the answer to that, you know? Um, but the idea of putting the audience on trial also very Sono to me. Like uh, there, there's an element of, of that in, you know, Michael Haneke's uh, funny games, of course. And I don't know that this isn't similar to that, um, but it also doesn't call attention to it. I mean, at least in, in terms of 
of of sort of confronting you with with the over over sexualization of of schoolgirls, except that it kind of does all the time. It again, you have to see this movie. Now, like, I'm curious to hear everyone's thoughts on this one because much like uh, your Suicide Clubs, um, Sion Sono movies tend to invite discussion. You know, Sono is an artist, and there there is no doubt of that in my mind. And your response to what uh, a surreal movie like this from a guy like Sion Sono could be wildly different from mine. Like, I've given you a, a couple of interpretations that I, I've read along with you know, a little bit of my own read uh, peppered in. But that's kind of one of the things that makes Sono so exciting and and why I like doing this as a solo show to speak kind of directly to you uh, about, you know, an artist who is difficult at the best of times. And that, there you have it. That's our, our deep dive on tag. Um, it, it's relatively short, but hopefully dense episode of the show um and and we're gonna be back in another two weeks uh i don't know if i if i said this previously uh the next series will begin in the next episode and that uh series will be all about um one miss call the one miss call trilogy so i've got the the new blu-rays of that coming in we'll we'll discuss the quality of those as well uh, I should have a uh, guest host uh, yet to be determined for uh, for those shows, but we'll we'll see how all that goes. Um, look, guys, I, I really appreciate, first of all, uh, you guys, you know, hanging out, waiting for the show to come back on a regular basis. Uh, I'm doing my level best to make sure that it gets to you in, in such a fashion. And also in a way that uh, preserves the good name of Hero Hero Go Show. So um, we'll definitely do more episodes like this. We'll be doing uh, shows with, with guests uh, to, to talk about the series. And I think that's kind of going to be our balance along with some, uh, some G-Spot stuff thrown in. Uh, if I can get my lazy butt around to, uh, to edit that last one. So um, uh, until next time, guys, uh, thanks. be sure you're, you're liking and rating and reviewing and all that fun stuff with the show it really makes a difference more importantly if you know anybody that is in the market for uh, an asian horror podcast uh send them our way uh, i think we do a pretty good job around here and uh and lastly i will say uh please check out everything over at legionpodcasts.com uh where you can find not only this show but a number of other great shows and uh and if you would uh you know you can throw a couple of bucks at us uh on patreon and uh and boy does that help out with with server costs and all that so if uh and you get stuff it's not hey that's not a one-way street yeah you give us a couple of bucks and we're going to give you some exclusive shows every month and that's how we do it uh there is a show uh, a live video show uh that we do called the ouija experiment experiment in which yours truly gets together with uh, a rotating chair of guests to discuss movies uh what have the word ouija in the title they are uniformly terrible so far. Uh, so, you know, that's a good time. Uh, so that's an exclusive show only on on Patreon. And then we have other uh, hosts doing stuff all the time. Uh, the, the guys over at uh, the Friday Nightmares, Heather and Scott, boy, just, just uh, filling that Patreon up uh, with good shit. So um, anyway, enough of the hard sell, sell on that one. Uh, thanks again for listening to Hero Hero Go Show. We'll be back with one missed call in two weeks. See you then. Mm-hmm.